Hi, the purpose of this lecture is to provide a simple introduction to fluorescence light microscopy. So one of the first questions you should probably ask yourself when you're venturing into a new technique is why you should even bother learning about or implementing that technique. And so there are many other techniques to study biological problems that aren't microscopy. There are Western blots, for example, shown here. Um, there's flow cytometry, and here's an example shown here. There's mass spec, there's an example shown here, and there are gene expression analyses, of which there's an example shown here. So there are all these other techniques that you can use to study biological phenomena. Why bother with microscopy? So there's a few key issues in any technique um, that you need to think about. So one of the first is, what's the spatial resolution that te the technique affords? Can you discern signals from individual cells? Can you assign phenomena to certain subcellular compartments? Is that possible with the technique that you're using? Or are you making sort of a, a puree of many cells at once so that you get kind of an average behavior across many of them or an average behavior across an entire cell? Another thing to consider is whether the technique um, it has so what is the temporal resolution of the technique is it able to distinguish things that happened um, continuously over many seconds minutes hours uh, is that possible uh, with the technique that you're using or is the implementation of the technique itself sort of precludes does it preclude experiments where you need to see what's happening second to second or minute to minute and finally is your technique compatible with live cells uh, there are certain things that are very, very difficult to study uh, if we are not looking at a cell or an organism that is alive. And so you might want to think about whether the particular techniques that you're using allow you to keep that organism alive while you're executing your measurements. And so the advantages of light microscopy are that it has a spatial resolution of about a quarter of a micron, a temporal resolution that can be a second or significantly less than a second, and it is compatible with live cells. And so a lot of interesting biology happens um, at this spatial and temporal resolution and with cells uh, and organisms that are alive. So this technique is well suited to studying a lot of biological phenomenon. And so uh, let me just digress for a moment uh, and, and just make a few points about spatial resolution. So uh, how big is the stuff we care about in biology? And so I encourage you to uh, take a look at this link. It's, it's something I've found uh, kind of nice um, over some time already. Uh, you'll need to activate Flash to make it run, but it's just simply something that, that shows you uh, the sizes of things in the universe. And so if you look at that, you'll see um, kind of a, a maybe a, a more elaborate version of, of something like this, where you can see how big things are relative to each other. And so the things that we care about in biology are typically in the sort of millimeter to tens or hundreds of nanometer, um, hundreds of nanometer range. And the light microscope is an instrument that's really well suited to measuring a lot of stuff in that range, uh, which is exactly the range that we care about if we're studying biological phenomenon. And so let me just give you one example from Scott Williams' lab here at UNC, which I think is really instructive for how microscopy can do things that other techniques can't. And so um, his lab studies uh, cell division. And, and one of the things that they studied in a, in, a, in a paper was how were those cell divisions oriented in the skin? And so this is a, a question that really doesn't even make sense without uh, looking at the samples with a microscope, because there's no way of, look, of seeing the orientation without just looking at the orientation. Not to mention that if you are trying to capture these cell divisions dynamically and see how they, uh, how they progress, you need to be able to do this in a live sample. And again, uh, the com this combination of resolution uh, on the spatial and temporal levels and just compatibility with something that is still alive, something that's really only possible with microscopy. Uh, so this, this, this is an example of a study that just doesn't make sense without uh, microscopy techniques being brought to bear on it. So uh, now that we've established why we might want to do microscopy, how do you do microscopy? So what do you need to keep in mind? And so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on a, sub a particular subset of microscopic techniques, 
called fluorescence light microscopy. So we're not going to talk about electron microscopy. We're not going to talk about bright field microscopy or polarization microscopy. We're just going to talk about fluorescence light microscopy. And the reason is that is the most common type of microscopy uh, performed in biological research. Um, and so let me sort of unpack these three kind of loaded terms one at a time. So we have fluorescence and light and microscopy. So let's start with light. So what is light? So light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it's basically the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that human eyes can detect. It's the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so if we zoom in to this region right here of the spectrum, and uh, I apologize, this is sort of flipped. Um, from here, uh, instead of going from red uh, and infrared to ultraviolet, it goes from ultraviolet to infrared. And so a key parameter when you're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, which um, these are waves, um, electromagnetic waves, is the wavelength. So the distance from peak to peak or trough to trough. Uh, that's a parameter that's going to come up over and over. And it's, it, it's really key to understanding a lot uh, of what we do in fluorescence microscopy. So what is fluorescence? So we know what light is. So what is fluorescence? So uh, one way to think about fluorescence is some, through uh, something called a Jablonski energy diagram, um, which I presume was invented by someone named Jablonski. And so this diagram has energy on the y-axis, and then it plots various energy levels of molecules as lines. And so at the bottom, we have a ground state where the molecule is in its lowest energy state. And then we have excited states, which you know differ in, in discrete energy levels from that ground state. Uh, and in terms of what's going on, they differ in the state of the electrons. So the electrons have higher energy in these excited states. Uh, those excited states are called S1, S2, and the ground state is called S0. In, in addition to these sort of big differences in energy due to differences in, in, the, in the status of the electrons, there are also more subtle differences in energy uh, that allow the molecule to occupy other energy levels, which are called vibrational energy levels. And these differ in basically the, 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 the positions of the bonds. So are they stretched, are they twisted? Uh, and these are much closer together than those electronic levels, which differ in the uh, energy states of the electrons. Now let's imagine that um, the molecule in the ground state uh, absorbs the energy from a photon. So this green line shows how much energy it absorbed. And, and this absorption of energy from an excited photon that uh, interacted with the molecule made it jump from the S0 to one of the S2 states. So what can happen once it's up there? So one thing that can happen is it can just, uh, the, the molecule can just vibrationally relax by moving around and by colliding uh, with the solvent or with other molecules uh, to the bottom of the S1 state. And then from there, it can decay further again, uh, through a non-radiative relaxation. So not really emitting any light, just basically bumping into something else uh, until it gets down to the ground state. And so if this happens, you really won't see anything. Uh, similarly, you could go from a slightly higher state to a slightly different one, and then again, relax non-radiatively down. But sometimes what happens is um, you excite the molecule, it relaxes down quickly to this sort of bottom of the S1 state. And then from there, the molecule can um, lose energy to go from S1 to S0, not in a non-radiative fashion, but rather by emitting a photon. And that is the process called fluorescence emission. So depending on uh, how much energy was absorbed uh, and how much energy was released, that will influence uh, the wavelengths of the photons that ex sort of the wavelengths of the photons that can excite and, and, and be emitted from an excited molecule. Uh, and the reason is wavelength and energy are connected through this equation. So E is energy, the lambda there is, is wavelength, and they're connected uh, by the uh, speed of light in the vacuum, which is C, and Planck's constant, which is eight, H. And so what you can see basically is higher energy photons have lower wavelengths, higher wavelength photons have lower energy, all right? And so from this kind of Jablonski diagram, we can convert this information into a different kind of graphs that sort of shows you the probability that a molecule will be excited and that once excited, it will emit a photon for different wavelengths.
uh, because the probability and energy of these transitions, so the probability that it will occur, and the energy involved in each, which can be converted to wavelengths, will define the fluorescence spectrum. So, for example, this is an excitation spectrum. This tells you at which wavelengths of incident light will a molecule be likely or most, most likely to be excited. This is an emission spectrum, which shows you once a molecule is excited, what, um, what are the most likely wavelengths of photons that will be emitted. And this is a direct result of the energy structure of the molecule. These peaks, the peaks of these uh, spectra are called the emission peak or the excitation peak. And the difference between them is called the Stokes shift. And it turns out the Stokes shift is actually the key to getting contrast from fluorescence. So what do we mean by contrast? Contrast, you can think of as how do I make what I am interested in different from the rest of the sample? Okay, so it's a way of finding difference. And so let, let's make an explicit example of how you would do this with fluorescence. Imagine a situation where you have a, uh, a cell uh, tagged with GFP, which is localized to the nucleus. And imagine that these are the excitation in blue and emission in green spectra for the GFP. So now imagine you have a light source, which output like a light bulb, a very bright light that outputs white light, so light of all colors. If you then put a filter in front of it, an excitation filter that only lets blue light through, and after the excitation filter at a 45 degree angle, you place something called a dichroic, which only reflects short wavelengths, but is transparent to long wavelengths, what you get is the following. The white light that came from the light source is cut down to just blue light, and the blue light is reflected from the dichroic down into the sample. Once it hits the GFP, the GFP with a certain probability will emit um, lower energy photons, which are green. These will be emitted in all directions. The emission is random, but some of them will go towards the dichroic. And this dichroic, while it reflects blue light, it is transparent to green light. So the green light goes straight through and then uh, it gets further uh, sort of carved out into the desired wavelengths by an emission filter ending up in a detector, which could be a camera or uh, an eyeball uh, with a retina at the back of it. So it turns out the use of fluorescence for labeling is incredibly powerful because smart labeling can give you tissue specificity. So you can, for example, express GFP only in the blood cells of a zebrafish embryo by using the appropriate promoter. It can also give you cellular specificity. So this is an example of um, cells that were transfected in brain slices ballistically. So you, you can culture slices of brain. You can shoot uh, DNA attached to gold particles. When it gets into the nuclei of certain cells, uh, the GFP will be expressed. But then maybe you're wondering what kind of cells you had. And if by, by staining that brain slice uh, with antibodies against markers for glia, you can determine which of your transfected cells were astrocyte cells, which are a kind of glial cell. Fluorescence labeling can also give you subcellular specificity. So this is an example of organelles marked by different fluorophores. The nucleus is, has been marked uh, by tagging histones. Other proteins have been used to tag the Golgi, mitochondria, peroxisomes, etc. And so using clever combinations of fluorescent proteins, you can mark different subcellular compartments. In addition, you can get molecular specificity. So for example, this is a, uh, a paper where they looked at transfiction factor binding and diffusion at the single molecule level. So combining fluorescence with microscopy, you can have labeling with specificity at the level of tissues, cells, subcellular compartments, or even individual molecules. So it's an incredibly powerful uh, toolbox that you can use to look at sort of very defined molecules that are in places of interest by a lot that are you know of biological interest so we've talked about fluorescence we've talked about light let's talk about the microscopy side of things so how do we visualize small things and we're looking at light microscopes and light microscopes can really be very complicated this is a cutout of a, actually a very simple microscope and you can see that it, it doesn't look simple at all there's a lot going on here so let's sort of strip this down to the very basics. What does a microscope do and how does it do it? So one of the first things that a microscope does, sort of one of the most important things, is generate contrast. So we talked about this a little bit. So how does it generate contrast? And it, generate con it generates contrast with how it illuminates the sample. 
And so we saw this before I, I went through this. Um, you can use a light source and a set of filters to excite uh, fluorophores and then detect those fluorophores uh, specifically by using a combination of excitation filters, dichroics, and emission filters. And so all of this sort of stuff that's conceptual on the left is here in the light path. And specifically, these three filters are placed in cubes here on a little turret that can rotate so you can have more than one cube easily access accessible to you when you image. OK, so that's, that's how microscopes generate contrast at a sort of very high level. Uh, what else do microscopes do? Well, they magnify and they resolve details. And they do both these things using lenses. And so where are the lenses on a microscope, the, the most important ones? They're here. They're the objective lenses. And so let, let's pause a moment and discuss the difference between resolving and magnifying. So resolving means that you're discerning details, whereas magnifying means that you're just making bigger images. Microscopes can do both. So let me show you an example of the difference between resolving and magnifying that has nothing to do with microscopy. Uh, and so this is uh, Jackson. So he's a dog I found on the internet, basically. And we're going to take a look at his nose uh, and, and see if we can figure out what resolving means and what magnifying means. And so if we, we zoom into his nose uh, at different levels, you'll see that the images in each row have the same magnification. So they're just as big. But the images on the left allow us to discern detail, whereas the images on the right don't. And so this is an example of a difference between resolving, which is what's going on on the left, and magnifying, uh, which is what's going on on both the left and the right. And so here's another example. This is a, a liquid crystalline sample of DNA. And you can see this sort of empty magnification where on the left, you can discern details. But on the right, you have the same magnification as on the left, but it's completely empty. It's not really providing that extra layer of detail. Uh, here's another example, which I really like. Uh, these are diatoms, which have um, very finely spaced and regularly spaced features that you can pull out with a microscope. And so um, what we see here are two sets of features in the two rows. And uh, a parameter has been adjusted on an objective lens that reduces the resolution of the lens. And so on the left, you can see a higher resolution view where you can discern details compared to the one on the right, where the image size is the same, the magnification is the same. Uh, it was taken with the same objective, but you really can't see those details. Uh, so the resol resolution depends not on the magnification parameter of an objective, but rather on its numerical aperture, or NA, which is this thing written uh, after that slash on any objective. Okay, That is actually what is way more important, because this affects how much light is gathered, at what angles it's gathered, and um, consequently, what kind of details you can resolve. And so here's an example of this. These are two 40x objectives. They have exactly the same magnification, taking images of, uh, I believe these are mitochondria in cultured cells. Uh, and so again, same magnification. They're both 40x, but you can see a dramatic difference in the level of detail afforded by the one on the right, which has an NA of 1.3 compared to the one on the left, whose NA is less than half that. Uh, so really higher resolution provided by higher NA means more detail in your images. So what else do microscopes do? They generate contrast, they magnify, they resolve details, and they also generate images like the one in the previous slide. And so how do we, um, how do we see those images? Through detectors. And the detectors are typically here, um, and they are cameras or photomultiplier tubes in most microscopes. So... Uh, let me take a segue into something else for a moment, which is to say that, in my opinion, the best microscopy is quantitative. So you can do way more than just get a pretty picture. And so I'm going to show you an example that I absolutely love, uh, which is the measurement of ATP concentration in neurons using images. And so this was work done by Vidya Ragnaraju in the lab where I did my PhD several years ago, but at this point now she has her own uh, lab and, and, and research group. And so what she did is she tagged synaptic vesicles, which are uh, very small vesicles that get uh, targeted out to uh, parts of neurons that connect to other neurons. So she tagged uh, those uh, organelles uh, 
with a construct that was a fusion of M cherry and a modified version of luciferase. So M cherry is a fluorescent protein that if you shine green light on it, uh, it emits red light. And luciferase is what's in basically fireflies. And it's something that can take a substrate called luciferin, ATP, and oxygen and transform it into oxyluciferin uh, and, and these other products you see here, as well as uh, emitting photons in that process. Um, so what, what um, my colleague did was, uh, while neurons were alive, she measured both the fluorescence, given by um, this sort of red blob here, and the luminescence, which was given by this, but was affected by oxygen, luciferin, and ATP. Uh, and so she got these two images. Then she permeabilized the cells, and she either removed all ATP or added fixed concentrations of ATP. And she did this many times and was able to construct an L by F curve, so a curve of the luminescence to fluorescence ratio for different concentrations of ATP. Now, the reason she did it this way is she wanted to uh, be able to normalize the luminescence to the amount of reporter that was present. And so why is this useful? Why is it useful to know what the L by F ratio is for different concentrations of ATP? The reason this is useful is then you can go and measure the L by F ratio and get an ATP concentration. And you can do this in situations where the neurons are undergoing different kinds of physiological stimuli. So you can measure the concentration of ATP just with images. This is a quantitative measurement. You never uh, split open the cells and made puree and put it in a test tube. This is all done with images. And this is a, a beautiful example of the kind of microscopy you can do um, if, if, you, if you really are careful and, and want to get quantitative uh, information. So the most common forms of fluorescence microscopy are two things called, one is called wide field, the other is called confocal. So I figured let's review them here. Uh, both are available in the microscopy services laboratory. Uh, in wide field microscopy, you have a sample with fluorophores inside. You illuminate that sample uh, with light of sort of a certain range of wavelengths using a bunch of lenses and other stuff that we already reviewed. Uh, some of those fluorophores may be in the focal plane of those lenses, some may not. So what happens to the light from each of those circumstances? So light from things that were in the focal plane of the objective, so for example in fluorophores there, so little bright dots, gets focused into dots on a sensitive area detector, which can be for example a camera. And so they get focused like this, whereas light from things that were out of, uh, in, in sort of objects that were not in the focal plane, uh, shows up more as like a spot or a set of rings. And so out of focus objects in this kind of microscopy are blurred. Uh, everything is happening in parallel. Uh, so this kind of microscopy is very fast, but it suffers from the problem that things that are out of focus add a lot of blur and reduce the contrast of the resulting images. In contrast to this, we have confocal microscopy. And so I'm going to kind of work through an example that's very similar and just show you the differences here. Uh, I've labeled in this case fluorophores in the focal plane with a different color to ones that are out of the focal plane, just so you can see what happens to the light from each more clearly. But you can imagine that these are really the same fluorophores. So in this case, what we have is we also use lenses, uh, but we have other stuff, things that scan, uh, that can scan uh, the light around. And the light is, does not come from a lamp as is commonly uh, used in a wide, wide field, but rather from lasers uh, that can be focused down to a really tight spot. So that's, the, the, that's what this is trying to represent here with this sort of converging and then diverging uh, light. And so the light is focused very tightly into the focal plane. And when it hits uh, you know, fluorophores that are either in and out of focus, we'll see what happens on the detection side of the microscope. So on the detection side of the microscope, we don't have a sensitive area detector. We don't have a camera. Instead, we have uh, a less sensitive spot detector. So what I mean by this is this detector, which is typically a photomultiplier tube, uh, just senses light and outputs a number that's proportional to how much light went into it. Um, uh, it has no spatial information whatsoever. OK, so in, in addition to, to that kind of detector, confocal microscopes have a pinhole, so a small hole uh, that's very cleverly placed at a particular location in front of that detector. So let's see how this all works together by tracing first what happens with the light from in-focus fluorophores. So fluorophores that are in the focal plane, which here on, on this diagram are symbolized as red dots. So the light from those fluorophores is aligned in a way such that it makes it through the pinhole and to the detector. 
In contrast, the light from things that come from out of focus planes uh, is aligned in a way so that it, most of the light hits the edges of the pinhole and never makes it through to the detector. So what this means is that light from out of focus objects is removed and this technique allows you to do optical sectioning. So even if you never physically cut the sample, you can um, sort of cut it virtually with this optical trickery and only see things from certain planes uh, independent of other planes in the sample. Now this is just light from one spot. What you do is you scan the laser around so you detect things in series, and then you reconstruct the image digitally in the computer by visiting every location in a small square region of the sample. So uh, wide field is a very fast, sensitive technique that's great for thin samples, because in thin samples, and by thin I mean typically less than 10 microns, um, there's not a lot of out-of-focus objects contributing blur to your image. You can do a lot of fun biology with these microscopes. So here's an example from the Calabrese lab here at UNC, where we use this uh, to measure three-dimensional distance between DNA loci. In contrast, confocal is slow. It's not as sensitive typically, but it is great for thick samples. And thick typically means more than 10 microns. And so obviously there are many, many things in biology that are thicker than 10 microns. Uh, an example that I really love is uh, this preparation, this spiral preparation of the cochlea from the Fitzpatrick lab. And so this is a, a pretty thick thing uh, that's about 100 microns thick. Uh, and so if you zoom in here uh, with a confocal, you can see this beautiful detail and see outer hair cells, inner hair cells, and nerve terminals. If you try to do this with a wide field, all of these singles would be swamped out by all of the out-of-focus light being contributed by other planes. So this is a great example of what you can use a confocal for. So imaging is great, uh, but uh, as always, there are caveats and limitations. So one of uh, a big limitation is that thick things are very hard to image. And so why is it that thick things are hard to image? And the reason is because uh, biological samples typically have inside of them different materials that have different refractive indices. So light propagates at different speeds through these materials. Uh, this leads uh, to a phenomenon called light scattering, where if you shoot a laser through the material, it only proceeds on a ballistic track for a short distance, and then, but then it sort of starts to diffuse. And so you can't really predict where the light is going or where it's coming from very accurately. And this leads to a lack of transparency, which makes thick things hard to image. And so what are your options if you have thick things? So one of your options is to just image thin things. So you can use cells cultured on surfaces, which are thin, or you can take thick things and slice them into something thinner. Now that obviously has a lot of limitations, but it's something that's done a lot in biology. Another option is you can image transparent things. So some things are naturally transparent and they've been used by models by biologists precisely for that reason. Examples are C. elegans or uh, zebrafish embryos. Another thing you can do is use a chemical procedure to render things that are not transparent, transparent. Now the problem is those procedures can take time, but more importantly, they just, they kill the sample. So you can't do that live. Uh, another option you can use is to use infrared light which doesn't suffer from the scattering phenomenon as much as sort of visible light. And you can use uh, something like a multi-photon microscope that, that uses an excitation scheme using that infrared light and therefore can penetrate hundreds of microns into living tissue. So uh, another limitation with microscopy is that you need to use light, uh, particularly with fluorescence microscopy where the intensities of light are high. Uh, so in microscopy, you need to use light to interrogate your sample and extract information from it. And light can damage a sample. So you can destroy fluorophores by the process called bleaching. Uh, so you can sort of make them irreversibly, um, you can damage them irreversibly such that when you excite them, they no longer emit photons. And that's what's shown on the top row. You can also, by virtue of exposing cells to light, damage them. And so you can see that uh, in those blebs there on that um, cell on the bottom right after 30 minutes of exposure. Uh, and so this is something that you'll have to deal with. Another problem is that fluorophores often overlap spectrally. So this is the excitation spectra of four very common fluorescent proteins, uh, ECFP, a GFP, EYFP, and m cherry, And you can see there's substantial overlap, which makes it difficult to find, for example, laser lines that will excite only one and not the others. And their emission spectra also can overlap substantially, which makes it difficult to find emission filters that will restrict um, uh, the light that you can collect to one uh, 
uh, of those fluorophores independent of the other. So you have to be careful uh, with this when designing experiments so that you're tracking what you think you're tracking and not something else that is bleeding into or cross-talking with your channel of interest. Uh, another issue that uh, we run into when we're doing fluorescence microscopy is that autofluorescence can actually be very high. So this is an example of the autofluorescence in sort of the GFP channel uh, in a brain that was imaged with a light sheet microscope, but that had never been labeled in this channel. And so you can see there's a tremendous amount of autofluorescence to the extent that they then uh, realized that they could actually use this to map different regions of the brain. Uh, but if you are trying to localize signals in the same channel, this autofluorescence can swamp it out. So this is another limitation of fluorescence microscopy. Uh, another sort of limitation to a specific kind of experiment is that uh, co-localization is very complicated. So this is an experiment that a lot of people like to do, to try and figure out if two things, two molecules, are in the same place. And so in standard microscopy, you might label one molecule in green, another in red, and then ask whether they're in the same place. And that might be the case with a standard microscope, but as you move into sort of super resolution microscopes, which I haven't discussed, but which are, have been available over the last 10 or 15 years, and you can localize things much more precisely there, what you see is that really what looked like two things in the same place um, looks very different when you have higher resolution. And so uh, a few points I'd like to make on co-localization. The first is that, uh, trying to make statements about whether things are near each other by using green and red color schemes uh, and yellow for overlap is practically useless. It's very easy to manipulate these images and they become very hard to interpret as a result. Um, so really, um, without any quantification, this kind of image is practically useless. Uh, another point I'd like to make is that co-localization does not imply interaction. It implies proximity. So it's very different to say two things are near each other than to say they are actually interacting. It's sort of equivalent to saying two people are in the same house, two people are in the same room. That doesn't mean they're shaking hands. Um, at the molecular level, another thing to consider is that there's actually no such thing as co-localization. Two things cannot be in the same place at the same time due to Pauli's exclusion principle. So that there's just no way for two things to occupy the same space. Uh, so what you mean actually at best is that two molecules are within a certain distance of each other. And that can be very powerful because it can provide support for the idea that they might be interacting. So if they're not close, they can't interact. And uh, you could also make very uh, interesting uh, and useful statements about how molecules move through different parts of the cells at different times. So one other thing to consider when you're doing microscopy is uh, often papers claim that uh, they're showing representative images. So you should always have a skeptical eye when you're reading papers and trying to figure out what does it mean that an image is representative. And so really what, what you should think about is what population can the authors uh, or yourself make inferences about? Because that's what representative means. It means that this image shows what's happening uh, to a population of, uh, of, of cells or samples like it. And to make those statements, you really have to be careful that you actually took um, those images sampling randomly versus picking areas that sort of look right, whatever that means. Because if you go picking around areas that look right, uh, your sample is representative of things that look right under some unspecified criteria uh, that's completely subjective. So be very careful with doing this, or at least disclosing what your criteria were uh, or what you tried for them to be, so people can have an accurate sense of what you really your conclusions can be generalized to. Another thing to be careful with is uh, the difference between showing something can happen versus how often it happens. So if all you want to do is to show something can happen, if you take an image of that thing happening, that's it, you've shown it. But that's very different from showing how often something can happen, which requires careful sampling, uh, taking a number of images and doing statistics properly. Another thing I sometimes see uh, when discussing these issues of what representative images mean and, and how to interpret them in, in papers is a confusion between images as evidence and images as illustrations. So, uh, th this happens a lot in papers where people have done a lot of experiments using one technique and then they want to, quote, confirm their results via imaging. And so let's say, for example, that people have been doing a lot of flow cytometry and they've seen a certain phenotype in a certain percentage of the cells. 
Uh, they then go looking for an image that will show the same phenotype, for example, expression of a particular marker. Uh, but, but that is really uh, sort of a cartoonish uh, level of, of evidence because uh, they typically don't do any kind of statistics to determine whether the frequency of that event that they see with microscopy is in any way similar to the frequency of the event that they see via another technique. So be very careful of falling into this trap of just showing an image and just uh, kind of illustrating a phenomenon and then claiming that this is independent evidence that the phenomenon occurs just as seen with another technique. Uh, and it's this is related to sort of the difference between showing something that can happen versus how often it happens. So, so another trap that sometimes folks fall into is confusing uh, sort of or, or obscuring uh, the actual quality used to acquire an image with, with some ideal publication quality. Uh, and so I, I see this all the time where, where people may take all of their images with a certain uh, set of settings that uh, lead to good quality images that are sufficient for analysis, but they may not be the most pretty images. Um, and, and then when, they, when they're preparing a paper, they want an image that uh, has much higher quality just so they can illustrate the phenomenon. So, so be very careful uh, if you do this to not mislead people into thinking that the image that you are showing uh, with, quote, publication quality is representative of the images you use for the analysis. It's really much better to show an image with the exact settings you use for the analysis so people can judge um, that analysis more fairly so they have a better sense of what went into the analysis. It's okay to show a publication quality image, but you should very clearly disclose uh, that this is an illustrative image taken with uh, sort of settings that required a lot more time. And it's just, again, more as an illustration than as to show what you actually utilized in your analysis. Uh, so be very uh, careful. This is a kind of a trap that a lot of people fall into. So an another sort of set of questions that uh, we get a lot when we do microscopy is, uh, and, and I get this all the time, is so sort of how many images should I take? Should I take five? Should I take 10? Should I take 20? And, and, and you know, so I, you know, I always think it's like, why, why five? Why 10? Why 20? So is it because uh, those are round numbers? Is it because that's the standard in the field? If so, why is that the standard in the field? Is it because some postdoc told you? Uh, why did they tell you that? And so, um, a related set of sort of questions is, is, is sometimes uh, an experiment has sort of nested levels of hierarchy where you, for example, uh, use animals to prepare cultures of cells, which you then plate into different dishes, and then you can image at different locations. So, so a question that can come up is even if you have a sense of maybe how, image, how many images you want to take, should you take a lot of images within a single dish? Should you take images across many dishes? Should you take images across many uh, cultures, across many animals, et cetera? And so uh, this really comes down to where there's more variability. Uh, so the, you know, if, if all of the images from a single dish are very correlated, then it may be a very poor use of your time to take a lot of um, images within a single dish because they'll effectively be pseudo replicates affected by uh, whatever that happen to that particular dish. And you may uh, have sort of much more informative uh, data if you take images uh, that were uh, that came from dishes prepared from many different animals. So uh, my answer to the question of how many images you should take is to do a, pair, a power analysis. So this is a formal uh, statistical technique uh, that, that will allow you to really estimate with some rigor how many images you need to take. And so you need to do a pilot analysis first. You need to do a little pilot experiment to get the data that you need to run this analysis. But basically what goes into this analysis is first, you know, you measure something. And so let's say, for example, you're interested in the size of cells. And so you can uh, take a bunch of images, uh, you know, just a small number uh, that you can do in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And, and you, for example, measure the variance in the cell size. Um, then you estimate or, or you, know, you sort of decide what's the minimal effect in the thing that you're measuring that you want to uncover. And so here, here's you know, a little bit of biological intuition is necessary. So you know, maybe a 1% change in, in, in cell size is really not very interesting, but a 50% you know, change might be something that, that has biological consequences uh, that are of interest to you. And so you, you sort of set, okay, this is the minimal size that I'm interested in uncovering. Uh, then you have to decide based on the experimental design, 
uh, what kind of statistical test you will eventually use to um, you know, uh, analyze your data. Uh, and finally, you have to, again, make a decision about what probability you want to find the effect if there is one. So you, you're going to design the experiment. A priori, you don't know if you're going to find an effect or not. And even if there, there is a, a real sort of biological phenomenon going on, you might miss it. So you need to set the probability that you won't miss it, uh, that the sort of you are happy operating with. And so you take all of these um, kind of things, some things that you measured, other things that you decided based on, on how you want to do your experiment. Uh, and there are formulas uh, that will allow you to, to, to determine how many samples you need under those circumstances to be able to make claims uh, with that probability uh, uh, that, that you sort of input. So uh, this is really the best way of doing it. Not many people do it, but it's really worth your while because you'll have a much better sense of, of, of how likely you were to find an effect if it was there uh, and sort of what minimal sizes of effect you can expect to uncover with that probability. So it's really worth taking a little bit of time uh, to do this properly. Okay, so that sort of concludes what I wanted to tell you about. And um, so this last slide is really about where you can get help. And so, the, you know, UNC has many imaging cores on campus. Any of them are, are a good source of help or just understanding things in microscopy. Uh, in my core in particular, if you go on the website, there's a rigor and reproducibility section, which has a lot of, I, I think, useful advice that you might want to pre-use. There are a number of online resources, which you can check in, in, uh, there, um, and all of those are, are free. Uh, one, one other that I sort of haven't added to this uh, list is uh, the Microscopy Services Lab it has a YouTube channel where there are you know, lectures on other topics as well as tutorials on how to use microscopes that may serve as a good refresher for you if you've already been trained, and that will eventually um, be the basis for for trainings that require a lot of less, a lot less in-person interaction. So I'm recording this uh, kind of at the beginning or mid-July, uh, and so eventually we will return to trainings, and and, and those tutorial videos will be a, a big part of those trainings. There are also some good books. Those two that I that I noted there uh, are my two favorites, um, and then there are some great courses which unfortunately at the moment are kind of closed, but they will eventually come back. And these are fantastic places to learn about microscopy. I have personally attended the first one of those, analytical and quantitative light microscopy. Uh, and it's sort of a, a crash course, very intensive for about two weeks on, on, on all forms, like many forms of microscopy. Um, and it, you know, you start with the properties of light and you end with, with really complex microscopes. So um, th those are places where you can get help. And of course, as always, you can, um, just uh, ping me via email and, and I'm happy to talk about how microscopy can help you with your research.